Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in our chats with Emily as we are talking our readings through all of the poems of Emily Dickinson contained within the Johnson edition. We turn out a poem 76, Exaltation is the Going. And here we are once again going to just stand in awe of what Emily can pull off. We have another poem dealing with the question regarding afterlife or the notion that one's life is a spiritual odyssey. We've also got what many call a definition poem, where a single word, in this case exultation, will be played with throughout the poem. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us from the beginning at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, a playlist, and I'm hopeful that you are able to have some time with our introductory set of comments, and I'm hopeful that you already have worked through the previous 75 poems. We just finished with poem 75, She Died at Play. Now, the first thing we should point out about this poem is that biographically, Emily did not actually see much of the sea. In fact, if she saw the sea, it's probably on her brief excursions to Boston, and we're not totally sure that she saw much of the sea. For example, she never got on a boat and sailed anywhere. So as she talks about the idea of the soul and traveling and a boat, like we've already seen in poems 30 and 52, it's not like she had any experience with this at all. However, she did know her Plato's Phaedo, and in that regards, the idea, you'll remember from earlier lectures we gave at LearnStrong.net, Socrates is there ready to drink his hemlock shade, and he's giddy, he's excited about the odyssey that he's about to take. He's an old man, he says, come on guys, to his, uh, to his sad and depressed uh, students, um, what, you, you didn't expect me to live forever, you ain't met no 200 year old people, and because that's the case, I'm, I'm about to go on a journey, I'm about to be excited about this. Of course, this traveling on a boat, will be part of W.B. Yeats' sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. The young and one another, their arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations of their song, and so, therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. So well, Emily's playing in an, in, an old, in an old, old tradition here. She's also, of course, messing around with one of her key concepts, eternity, and, um, and in that regards, we're going to see some of that played out here. But I do want to point out, there is a tr remarkable, joy-filled, optimistic voice here. The divine intoxication, as she will talk about it. But instead of intoxication, she starts with exaltation. And she'll say it this way. Exaltation is the going of an inland soul to see. Past the houses, past the headlands, into deep eternity. Bred as we among the mountains... Can the sailor understand the divine intoxication of the first league out from land? Now, it is true, and, and, and any number of scholars have pointed out, that there is a solecism or a grammatical incongruity at play here in the second stanza. We'll have to mess around with it in a little bit. First of all, exultation. When we hit poem number 1153, um, we're going to be playing a similar game where she'll say it this way, Through what transports of patience I reach the solid bliss to breathe my blank without thee, attest me this and this. By that bleak exaltation, I won as near as this, thy privilege of dying, abbreviate me this. Her love of this word exaltation as well will be in 1642. When we pick up that poem later, we'll see it this way. She'll say, the earth she'd be so big, what exaltation in the woe, what wine in the fatigue. Now, some of that notion of finding the joy in the middle of the pain and suffering is standing, I think, in some ways behind this word picture as one is getting in the boat and ready to sail out to sea. Notice, the exaltation is in the going. Now, in, in 1890, when this poem was published in a collection, they actually titled it Setting Sail. Um, and we've already seen the idea of the souls being a, a passing or a traveling through a boat in poems 30 and 52. So we've already kind of seen this. We've witnessed this idea. Exaltation is the going of an inland soul to sea. The key here is inland because Emily herself lived inland. She did not live next to the ocean. She did not like wall. She did not, you know, see the ocean every day kind of thing. Um, so here, in other words, a soul, notice not herself, but her soul, is in inland, uh, has never actually gone on this journey, whatever this journey is that will be the afterlife journey. Notice we're going past the houses, past the headlands, where the safe, where the safety is, into the deep eternity. Uh, that is to say, she loves this notion of eternity and the the complexity of that question of what is eternity. And she says, the soul is ready to go. And then she shifts a little bit. And now we're going to, it's grammatically going to be a little bit complicated, but we'll play through it. 
bread as we, now who is the, what's the antecedent of the pronoun we? Um, because she'll say, among the mountains, can the, solar, uh, can the sailor understand? So what we're talking about, sail the sailors, who, of course, get in boats and go all the time. No, no, this is not what she's saying. The we here is her conversation, not with her body, but with her soul. To this regards, sounding a whole lot, of course, like Walt Whitman in, in any number of passages as we studied it with Talks with Walt, when we did all of the poems of Lisa Grass together. And you'll remember that he, he loves to do this, Song of Myself, Passage 5. I mean, uh, all, all over the place, he'll speak to himself by speaking to his soul. Um, bread as we, among the mountains, um, at, uh, when we get to poem 1052, she'll say it this way, I never saw the sea. Um, and, and so, you know, in other words, if you haven't had the experience, then you can't be like a sailor who kind of gets in a boat and goes, oh, here we go again, right? Notice she'll ask it, can the sailor really understand, she doesn't use the word really, I injected it, the divine intoxication. It's interesting, her use of the word divine will come back at 435, much madness is divine as sense to the discerning eye. And her use of intoxication will come when we do poem 1359. And I'm interested in that in, in her use of the, uh, of the uh, way she uses it there in, in 1359. She says it this way. A long sigh of the frog upon a summer's day enacts intoxication upon the reverie. Um, this notion of being intoxicated as in fully sassoon. And I think a lot of this has to do with their understanding of Plato's treatment of Socrates and the daimon. You'll remember that Plato in Symposium and elsewhere uh, we'll talk about how Socrates always has this daimon, that is to say this spirit that just kind of intoxif intoxifies him in some way, and he's just kind of sassooned with it. Notice, a sailor cannot appreciate the divine intoxication of the first league out from the land. She asks it in the form of a rhetorical question. Um, a, the first league, by the way, is three statute miles, or 4.83 k um, kilometers, and n any number of scholars who have read this have pointed out that when you're that far from the land, you can in the water, you can still see the land. Now, I'm not sure Emily appreciated it that way when she just said the first league out. I think what she really means here is on your way out, right? That is, that, that is uh, as, as the soul is setting out, there's this excitement, this divine intoxication that will be all-consuming. Now, here in a little bit, we're going to hit poem 160, and we're going to play this same game out again only here, many have pointed out, that in poem 160, it's a little bit of a darker vision. Just lost when I was saved. Just felt the world go by. Just girt me for the onset with eternity. When breath blew back and on the other side, I heard recede the disappointed tide. Um, the poem will go on. It's a darker vision. It's not this joy-filled vision, this divine intoxication of this vision. Well, what are we going to do with a set of lines like this at 2A? Well, I think that there is a notion that, again, we've seen this before with success is counted sweetest, that if you are deprived of something, right, you, for example, you haven't seen the ocean, you haven't sailed, there is a divine intoxication that is ubiquitous there in the experience that somebody who's seen it normally cannot, cannot enjoy it. I had a pal who taught up in Alaska, and in his first weeks there, he was the cross-country coach, and so he took his group of students across a bay to a cross-country meet, and on the way there, all of his students were on the deck of the little ferry, and they were all sitting there with their headphones on in their, in their uh, deck chairs. He was blown away by the beauty of this, because he'd never seen it. And so he was looking out from the, uh, from the deck of the ship, when all of a sudden, out of the water come these whales. And they're just like breaching and splashing. And he, he, he's just, blown. he said, I was like a little child. I couldn't believe, he said, it almost made me weep to see how amazing it was. And then I looked and none of my students, none of my athletes were there. So I turned around and I ran up to the first kid and he had his headphones on and his eyes were shut. And I shook him and I said, hey, hey, hey. And he lifted it and he looked at me and he said, whales, right? And he put it back. Well, of course, these children are going up seeing this. So for them, it was no big deal. It's kind of like you guys looking at the Tetons and, and asking why Winnebago's pull over to take pictures of the Tetons. They're mountains, man. We've seen them a lot. Here, she says, sailors, well, they don't understand the value of being deprived from seeing the, of seeing the ocean, and therefore, they can't have that divine intoxication. She says the soul can, in its experience of merging into eternity, obviously post-death, uh, can have this divine intoxication. And of course, as we said, 
there's kind of some strange grammar here that you assume that what she's at first talking about are the sailors, but in fact she's talking about herself and her soul. We mentioned in 3A, Plato's Phaedo. Um, we mentioned poem 1052, I Never Saw the Sea, and uh, poem 160 as well, which we read. I like uh, um, Walt Whitman's passage to India. We've given full lectures, of course, it talks with Walt, but go back and look at that. That notion that traveling and sailing and the voyage is everything. Of course, at 3B, this is, this is Homer's Odyssey, isn't it, right? So it, it is an interesting question to ask. Do you see your life as an odyssey? Do you see your life as a journey that is, in fact, headed towards a divine intoxication. I hope our study of Emily's stuff is leading you to a divine intoxication. Thank you.